Hey, thanks for being back with us again, David. Um, just, I mean, very broad, 30,000 feet from the last time we chatted. Tell me how your thinking has evolved. You know, I'm, I'm kind of curious what has surprised you uh, uh, over the last couple of months. And also maybe, you know, what you think is, is a big part of the story that the, the large national conversation, or maybe global conversation is missing. Well, those are great questions. I have a feeling that when you and I spoke a couple months ago, deep down, we had um, a hope that perhaps this whole um, pandemic um, might turn out to be something that would not have, you know, lasting effect. And I guess, you know, the bottom line today is it, it's clear this virus is not going away, at least anytime soon. It's, um, it's here, it's established itself in the human populations around the globe. And it looks as though it's, it's with us for the foreseeable future. I mean, at least the next few years, um, possibly longer. And, and what this next few years looks like, I think will depend upon um, how well we are able to develop immunity to the virus, um, the durability of that immunity, and whether we can intervene in ways to hasten the development of immunity with a vaccine. Um, and then perhaps um, our ability to develop drugs that will mitigate the effects of the disease until we have that kind of immunity, both as individuals and as a population. Is there anything, back to my first question about surprises, is it, is it more contagious than you thought? Uh, what we know about immunities, maybe say a little bit more to the best of your knowledge. I've, I've read different kinds of reports about what yeah. we're learning on that. Um, you know, what's, what's unique about this particular virus from your point of view? Um, it's still full of surprises to us. And, and I think what that says to us is, this is a virus that has, has, not, has not seen humans, has not been in humans before. This is, right. this is a totally new encounter. And, um, and so this plays out in terms of surprises with respect to its clinical features, so the, the kind of disease it develops uh, or causes in humans. Um, we're still every day almost discovering some really interesting, totally unanticipated clinical features of the illness from strange rashes in the feet of children right. to, uh, to unusual kinds of, of organ failure to um, clot formation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing. The other is, you know, to, to the point that you raised, this is an incredibly transmissible agent, really, for, um, for a virus that still retains some degree of, of pathogenicity, it it's, has an am amazing amount of transmissibility. Sometimes those things are trade-offs, one against the other, but this one has a, a pretty prodigious amount of both, really. Scary and sobering. Um, Michelle, how are we doing in terms of response uh, here in the United States? You know, I've heard you speak before and I've been, you know, we're all, we're all trying to become COVID experts these days. I've noticed in my casual conversations with my neighbors, everybody seems to know everything about even the latest papers that have been published here at Stanford, including those that haven't been peer reviewed, I might add. Um, but one of the conversations I've been having with my Russia colleagues is, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a lot of pressure and on the Russian Federation. And you saw, uh, you know, in a very vivid way, different parts of the Federation responded in different ways to that crisis. And suddenly, they, the differences between states and republics were accentuated. This moment, just as an observer, reminds me that we are a federation. How are we doing both the, in terms of the national government and the federal response and the state response from your point of view? Yeah, it's a really interesting analogy. I, I think overall, those of us in public health would say we have not done a great job overall on the response and that the grade we might give varies from state to state, uh, but that the national response is not an A and not a B. <laughs> Yeah, it really does call uh, to mind relatively ancient debates within our union about this federal structure of government that we have. You know, federalism is our constitutional structure dividing power between the national government and state and local governments. And we've long had faith in that system as a check on tyranny 
and a means of providing uh, individual states the ability to express different values and try policy experiments. And most of the time we think it works pretty well. This time it hasn't in the sense that the powers that we have left with the federal government have not been well used and the discretion afforded to the states has been used wisely by some and not by others. And how, just let's take both of those in turn, first the national response and then how to explain the variation in the state response. Um, it is this curious thing, you know, you know we don't have uh, militias anymore, although when we go back, of course we did, but if we were being attacked by the Chinese or the Russians or the Iranians, of course we would expect our national security apparatus to defend us. Uh, it sounds like when it comes to health that we don't have a national health strategy, or, or is that, is that always been the case, or is that peculiar to the Trump administration? So first, help us kind of mm -hmm. evaluate why the national response has been so erratic, and then, you know, help explain variation in the states. Give us your grades for different states, and explain why some are doing better than others. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a relatively modern idea to think about public health as part of our national security, the concept of biosecurity, as you know, Mike, fairly new. Right. Um, and historically, our, you know, most of the health threats that we've had to deal with have been at the sub-national level. And you know, if we go back into the last century, that was true. And when we had highly infectious diseases uh, go into outbreaks because people didn't travel very much and very quickly, right. they could be dealt with by local governments in most cases and occasionally by states, but there wasn't often a need for the national government to be involved. Primarily where they were involved historically is in dealing with the quarantine of travelers from overseas, especially ships. And that's pretty much the same structure that we have today, and it's a structure that remains embedded in the constitutional design that only where we have a health threat that crosses borders, either international borders or interstate borders, do our federal health powers get triggered, either the kind of everyday powers that the federal government has by dint of its power to spend or to regulate interstate commerce or to provide for national security or emergency powers that it can invoke um, after a, a public health emergency is declared. Those powers really only attach to the movement of people and goods and viruses across state lines. Um, and so much of the response to this virus, okay, of course, has again been at the state level, even though the states are responding to the rapid spread of a pathogen across state lines, they have been virtually alone in their efforts to stop the spread. And uh, I wanna get David's view on both the national security piece and global, but give us a sense of what states you think are doing well, what ones are not doing so well. And here in California, of course, we've even had variation at the, at the county level. Um, how, who gets good grades, who gets bad grades, and how would you explain the variation? Well, if your criterion are which, which uh, authorities have been effective in arresting the spread, I think that we, the, the grades are clearly given uh, best to those in the West, the, the Western states, and in the Northeast, uh, with the exception of New York, probably, that really acted very early to right. implement social distancing orders. As you know, here in the Bay Area, our six counties went as early as March 16th when there were just about 4,200 cases of COVID-19 recorded nationally. Very few here in the Bay Area at that time. Kind of amazing to think about that, isn't it? I it is, it and you know, it, it was a gutsy move to say the least for them to yes. impose orders of such sweeping scope with such a small caseload, but our health officers knew that they were just seeing the tip of the iceberg because they could not get the test kits. They knew they weren't seeing the full extent of the spread here. So they acted quickly. A week later, the number of national cases, again, just the ones we knew about, had increased tenfold. Still only nine states had implemented statewide social distancing orders. And again, it tended to be concentrated in the West and the Northeast. Two weeks after that, we're up to 163,000 reported cases nationally, and still 20 states had yet to implement statewide orders. Most of those states are falling down the middle and into the southern United States. And, you know, there's some alignment of the speed with which state act, states acted and their political orientation with the bluer states tending to move first. Interesting. David, how do you see the response? Um, uh, first at the national, but I'm also interested in your perceptions, analysis of, of the global response 
Are we coordinated enough? Are we not? You know, give us your take on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in some ways the lessons and how it's played out is very much similar. There's been um, balkanization and fragmentation of what might have been a more effective leadership role, um, both at the global level, uh, because of, of nationalism, national interests, supply chains that break easily, forcing individual nations to make um, hard choices about whether to cooperate and rely or not, or go it on their own. Um, similar kinds of stories play out statewide as well. Um, there are the issues of, of trust and, and information flow that have also broken down both domestically and internationally. And, um, and just recently, for example, this whole issue of um, where did this virus come from and how well are we going to cooperate with other nations in trying to sort that out? That now has you know, global geopolitical implications for whether we're going to be able to um, share critical resources, but also work together towards some kind of more effective global governance scheme, which frankly right now is looking pretty miserable. Looking pretty miserable indeed. Yes, um, you know, U.S.-China relations were already moving in a very negative way, but it, they most certainly have accelerated um, uh, in the last, really, literally, in the last couple of weeks. Do you are you surprised at the global response being so fragmented? I mean, you've been working on these issues for a long time. Biosecurity is not a new word for you. Um, you know, give us your assessment in the same way we were talking about the federal system of A, how the international coordination has failed or not, and then B, are there some states performing better than others, and, and how would you explain the differences? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the two key issues are leadership and resources and resource allocation. And, and we've known already that, that both of those issues um, have some potential um, you know, weaknesses and, and flaws. The WHO was called to task for its response to Ebola. Um, I think they did make some efforts to try to bolster their, um, you know, their organization, uh, how they approach problems, um, the way in which they respond, but frankly, they have always been underfunded, and I don't think they've ever really had a chance to fully exercise a scheme that, that actually plays out well regionally in terms of, of different nations. And then you've got the resource problem, which is you know, still a huge issue for those countries that want to do the right thing and simply don't have the means to do so. WHO is not able to make up those gaps. Right. And um, right now it's really falling on its face in my view. Are there certain countries that you think are more exceptional than others in how, the way they've responded, or is it too early to make those kind of evaluations? Yeah, you know, th there's some really interesting um, heterogeneities between nations that we don't yet fully understand, but right. where there it does seem to be some clue as to why. Um, the ones that stand out, at least in my mind, are, are countries like, um, ta well, Taiwan, um, South Korea. Right. Um, uh, perhaps uh, the Scandinavian countries, um, Germany in some ways, um, and, you know, and others around the world. But, um, but again, there are still some, some differences in, in what's happened that we just don't, aren't able to explain well. But Michelle, to you, if I could pivot now to the debate already, states are opening up. So in the same way we had a debate about when to shut down or not, the debate between states, now we're having a debate between states about opening up. Um, how do you yourself uh, evaluate the trade-offs, the economic versus health? And, and David, I'll come to you on that as well. And again, we have variation among states. How do we explain why some are more eager to open up than others? Well, I think I'd start by saying that I think the whole framing of this as a zero-sum game between economic health and physical health is a wrong turn. There right. are plenty of countries in Europe that have avoided that framing by having the government step in comprehensively to provide a safety net to those who are out of work, to those who need access to care uh, and long-term support. We have not done that. There's no indication that we intend to do that other than these very meager and very short-term relief packages. And that's why 
the choice has been framed in terms of right. a trade-off or a choice between working or being healthy or between having a paycheck and uh, not having COVID. It does not have to be that way. And I think that is the central lesson to be confronted from this epidemic going forward is that we don't want to get ourselves in a situation where we have to make that choice again. Now that we're here, how do we do it? Nobody has any idea. Honestly, the, you know, the public health officials are working very hard to come up with a principled framework for weighing those choices, those different values, and plugging in data points and models to help them quantitate those judgments. Right. But this is no one has ever done this before, and there is no one framework. Every state is going to have a different weighing of economic health versus physical health, and public health officials just have to do their best to try to filter those public preferences in a responsible way and effectuate them with the best available data. But there's no playbook for this. And does that suggest we'll be cycling on this? We'll be opening and closing, and, and but to varying degrees, but it'll be a process over over how long actually months or years what what do you think i think it's very it certainly we will see rebounding we're already beginning to see preliminary evidence of rebounding in, in areas that have failed at the limit or are beginning to loosen social distancing orders and then the question is will they recalibrate where that dial is set as between economic health and physical health or will the people do it for them because another possible outcome of this is right. that you open things back up people start to get sick and everybody skitter, skitters back to their houses and then you're in a situation where you've kind of got the worst of both worlds with people who aren't into behaving responsibly sort of out there and mixing and mingling but not in numbers sufficient to give the businesses the economic health they need. Wow, that is a big, hard dilemma. David, do you, what do you think on this, this question of, of the timing of opening, generally speaking? Well, um, to get back to your earlier question about which states, in my view, have done a better job and are likely to continue doing a better job, to me, it's those that have um, strong leadership, um, strong belief in the importance of, good public, of a good public health system, um, and um, a willingness to, to um, embrace the, the value of, of doing good public health science on the fly. That I think the way we learn our way out of this is to do thoughtful, anticipatory experiments, essentially, right. controlled right. experiments. We, we try something, we try to control the other variables, and then we test and gather you know, the situational awareness data that allows us to learn from the experiment. And then you move on to the next experiment, mm -hmm. you iterate. And there are states that are really thinking that through, including ours, um, including Michigan, Ohio. And, um, and I think, you know, no one's gonna have a perfect uh, run at this, but those that do it in this kind of coordinated, thoughtful, strong leadership at science-based fashion are the ones that are gonna do better. Well, I think on that optimistic note, we'll end. Well, maybe one last question, actually. It's, it's a, always comes up in conversations, and it's a it's somewhat political one, but just yesterday I was in a conversation, and somebody used this re really nice phrase. If you could have one edit to history, um, it has to be a little edit uh, over the last couple months that might have made things better, uh, either at the national or subnational or global le uh, level, uh, what was one missed opportunity that if we could have run the run history again, we might be in a better place? Michelle, I'll start with you, and we'll end with David. Well, I, I agree with the Atlantic reporter who who said that the original sin in this epidemic was the failure of the CDC with the testing. I think so many of our current right. dilemmas can be traced back to that early failure. First, the decision not to use the publicly available test promulgated by the WHO, notwithstanding the evidence that it was working fine. And then once problems erupted with manufacturing for the tests that CDC developed itself, instead of admitting that they needed help and needed alternatives developed to, to, to frantically try to get a workaround and use up three or four of our absolutely critical weeks. So from that has flowed all of our resulting problems con with containment. Even today, we are not ramped up with testing to the level that we need for reopening and effective community mitigation. So to me, that is a relatively small edit that could have made a huge difference. It had huge consequences. Great, great observation. David, do you have anything more to add? What would be your edit? Yeah, my edit would have been um, further back in time when um, spread had had taken place less so, and there might have been a better chance to alter the course of events. 
I would have hoped maybe that the Chinese um, remembered well the lessons they learned the hard way during SARS-1 mm -hmm. in 2003. Right. And the dangers of trying to cover up and conceal and, and hope for the best before letting people know that they would have acted upon that immediately. And in mid-December, called the WHO, the US, and all of their allies, people who had been working with them prior to that on these emerging viruses, to come to Wuhan immediately and look at what was going on and help them assess um, how best to intervene at that very point. Right, great observation. Thank you both for a fantastic conversation. Tragically, we're gonna to have to have you back. Uh, the, I suspect this is gonna be with us for a long, long time, but it is important, A, we keep talking about it, but B, as both of you just said, to learn from the mistakes from the past so that we are better in the future.